Hey everybody, the October 2020 Roundup is brought to you by Fun Again Games. And I gotta say folks, October 2020 was insane, as it is every year because it's Essen Spiel time, and I always try to get as many games as I can covered before the convention. And even though this year it was digital, I still pushed myself past the breaking limit. I am exhausted because I'm gonna be talking about 36 new games that have been covered over the last four weeks by me and my contributors Shay and Ryan and oh boy um it's a record breaker I've never done a roundup this long maybe we'll break this record next year I kind of hope not because that was a lot of games to play and I'm about to count them all down for you but before I get to that hey you know what folks you know what my mom Bobby here, uh, 73 years old, went out and voted yesterday. I drove her down. She was so excited for like the last couple of years. Anybody ever asked her about her health? She just keeps saying, I just want to make it until I can vote. And uh, she did. And she was super duper uh, pleased. And you know what? You've been hearing from everybody, at least if you're an American. Please go out and vote. Get out the vote. It's so important that you vote. And you don't need to hear that from me again. What I want to say is... I am so sorry if it's not as easy for you as it is for me and my wife and my mom living here in Washington State. Uh, it should be just this simple. There should not be any hurdles standing in anyone's way. And if you are looking to this Tuesday and saying, oh, I, what I have to do, I know I'm going to have to go and sit in line for hours, um, and I might even get turned away, and all this insanity that's happening, I, I, I hope... You can get through it. I hope you, like me, can vote for someone who wants to ensure it's just this easy for everyone, because it should be. And uh, that's all I'm going to say about that, folks. I mean, I think I wear my feelings on my sleeve pretty strongly. Vote for someone who can actually make a change for the better so everybody can experience this. Let's all make America think a little bit harder this Tuesday. Oh, I just did it. I just told you to go and vote, didn't I? Anyway, sorry. Uh, let's get that out of the way and get over to games, shall we? Alrighty. Um, we've got a few games that I'm going to be talking about from my contributors, Shay and Ryan. And that's not in a countdown form. Like always, I'm just going to go through their stuff alphabetically because I haven't played any of it. But uh, if you want to know more about any of these games, you can go on ahead and uh, find it in on the channel uh, because they were all very engaging videos, starting with Ark and Shield. And now this one is a paid preview, like uh, all the stuff uh, that Ryan and Shay covered this month. And this one is not on Kickstarter yet. It was supposed to launch, but I believe they've delayed it, so I'm not quite sure when it's going to launch. But it's a very interesting kind of fantasy adventure game that is a deck builder. But unlike most deck builders, the thing about this one is when you get when you buy new cards, they go directly into your deck. And at the end of your turn, you don't take your spent cards and put them in a discard pile. You put them back in your deck. And at the beginning of every round, you shuffle your deck up and draw a new hand. This is very akin to Orléans, the bag builder, where, um, you know, because of this nature, you might be able to get to the stuff you just bought really quick, or it might stay away from you as you shuffle and reshuffle. But the interesting thing about this is, basically, your deck is kind of becoming almost like a a customizable die that is full of all kinds of things that your characters can do. Because the characters, the followers you get, they go directly into play and they just stay with you. It's more like the upgrades and abilities they get go into the deck and every round you never know exactly what your followers are going to be able to do. It's a really interesting idea. Um, a really big game changer from the way uh, deck builders normally work. And for anybody who really likes Orléans and likes that extra level of tactical unpredictability, Ark and Shield might be worth checking out. Then, Shay also covered Brick and Mortar. Again, a paid preview. And this is a very, very sharp, uh, moderate, mid-weight, not quite heavy, but, you know, definitely, uh, you know, getting there. Get, uh, economic simulation, all about supply and demand. Everybody's trying to build up their own series of shop fronts. Not just one shop, but uh, basically we all have strip malls, effectively, and we're trying to get different shops installed that are creating the demand for their... Um, for whatever it is they're selling, but players are also having to manage the uh, uh, supply of these items. And I watched Rache's run through, and I thought, man, this is so great. I'm almost kind of regretting not covering it myself because I thought about covering it. But then 
uh, Shea got to the point where he could demonstrate just how cutthroat this game can get. And I remembered why I took a pass. Because I think the economics here are absolutely brilliant. But this game can get a little in your face if uh, you have set up the perfect round where you've got all the supply in place, you've created the demand, but then somebody else just swoops in in these auctions, these kind of blind bid auctions, kind of, that, uh, uh, you know, it could just really mess with your plans. Super sharp game, and I... Don't think... Has this launched yet? I'm not quite sure. If not, it will be alive soon. But I do think it's live right now. But anyway, uh, keep an eye out for it if you're looking for a really interesting heavy economic or medium to heavy economic simulation with a fair bit of player interaction. That's brick and mortar. Then we have got Rain Absolute, another Kickstarter one. And... Man, I don't remember. I don't think this is live yet either. Yeah, I know this one is going to be going live, I think, next week. And uh, Shay covered it because uh, he likes dueling card games. And this looks so much more interesting than your typical Magic the Gathering clone. Because there is a healthy dollop of bluffing um, and you know positional gameplay in addition to the, oh, my, my Ent attacks your goblin horde or whatever and he takes out the horde but then he gets damaged. You know, it has all that kind of back and forth as players are trying to wipe out each other's leader but there's a lot of extra depth and surprising complexity to this uh, uh, asymmetrical game where each player has a different group of of uh, of uh, um, units, I guess, warriors and whatnot, and uh, you can never be 100% certain what exactly they're capable of doing. Even if you think you know, players might have given them secret buffs, or they might have been bluffing. Watch uh, Shay's run-through. I found it really compelling. Uh, if I like this kind of game, I would certainly play this over a Magic the Gathering any day of the week. But that was Rain Absolute. Then we've got the Shards of Madness, which in all honesty, I was keen on trying out myself, but I didn't think Jen would care for the dark gothic overtones because this is a game where we are running a cult, trying to summon eldritch beasts and you know bring about the end of the world and madness and all that. And I knew just Jen wasn't going to be interested in that subject matter. But it's interesting. The gameplay of this, the, the theme is really dark, but the gameplay is really um, kind of splendorish in that it's all all about collecting combinations of gems and then spending them to get these cards into play. And there's a lot of really clever stuff. This is kind of like a gamer splendor, uh, for lack of a better term. But then with a Cthulhu Eldritch Horror style theme layered on top of it. Uh, I believe this one is live on Kickstarter now and it is doing pretty well. So you can find out more about it with Shay's uh, run through of uh, the Shards of Madness. And then finally, both Shay and Ryan covered Veiled Fate. And this one is also live on Kickstarter right now. This is another paid preview. And oh my gosh, this game has blown up. This looks like it is a monster, monster hit. And uh, having watched both of the guys' videos, I can certainly see why. At its heart, this is a game where we are basically backing certain demigods that we want to see succeed, but it's secret. Nobody knows which god I'm trying to support as I move gods around from area to area on the board and have them complete various quests as time passes and, you know, we're constantly trying to make sure... Well, okay, if I make this action, my favorite god will do well, but I don't want to be really obvious about that because if everybody else can figure out who my favorite god is, they can actually take steps to tank his overall... Um ratings, and I will not make as many points. So, uh, you know, it's an equal part subterfuge, but also straightforward, questy type stuff. And the interesting thing is, um, players do have to work together to make sure that the world comes alive. So there's almost kind of a semi-cooperative aspect to it, too. It's got amazing uh, components, really fantastic art, and it seems like very, very sharp gameplay. I took a pass on it because I really don't know how interesting it's going to be with two. I tend to think these games work better at higher player counts. Um, uh, but anyway, that was Veiled Fate, and those were the games that Ryan and Shay talked to us about this month. And now we are going to move on to my list. Although, I'm going to try something a little bit different, folks. I have got two uh, list countdowns this month. And let's start with the first one, which starts with number eight, Escape Curse of the Temple, Traps. And what am I talking about? Here's the deal. Uh, last month... I started getting some people feeding back on the uh, on the roundup about how 
Yo, we're kind of sick and tired of seeing all these expansions, specifically Marvel Champions expansions, always ending up. Could they be somehow listed separately? Uh, because, you know, it, it can be a little anticlimactic if you get all the way to the number one of a, of a list of 20 or 30 games, and it's an expansion for a game that came out years ago. So I thought, okay, I'll give that a try. This month, um, I've got three lists. The Ryan Shea one I just did, now I'm going to be talking about expansions. I'm going to do a countdown of the best expansions and reprints I played this month. And after that quick list is done, then I will continue with the countdown of the new games. Make sense? Okay. Then let's talk about number eight, Escape Curse of the Temple Traps. Um, yeah, this is my lowest rated expansion because in all honesty, Jen and I were a little disappointed. And we love Escape Curse of the Temple. And, you know, the idea thrown in here that there are these new tiles that create traps in various and sundry ways was really, really neat. I like the core concepts and some of the traps we experienced were very neat. But there's this whole class of traps that looking through them seems to me that they were designed with more players in mind. There's no scaling to them whatsoever. And in a two-player game or a solo game, game, they would be insanely hard to finish and would force players to stick together at all times to be able to have a chance to be able to deal with these traps. And that's no good. So I was kind of disappointed that there wasn't scaling to say, hey, you know, the, to be able to deal with this trap, you have to do this particular thing, you know, based on the number of players in the game. A few little things like that could have made traps a lot of fun. But as it is, thus far, it's my least favorite thing. Although I would love to try it sometime at a higher player count because I suspect, on the whole, they work really great. They're nice, simple, uh, you know, they're easy to deal with in the real-time gameplay. But again... At the lower player counts, Escape Curse of the Temple Traps. Mwah. Alrighty. And then we move on to my number seven, Seven Wonders Second Edition. And it is a total and complete coincidence. I swear that it is my number seventh. I didn't even realize until I was putting the PowerPoint slide together today that it came in at number seven. I did not do this entire rejig of the entire roundup specifically, so Seven Wonders Second Edition can be my number seven, but it is. And why is it not higher, considering the fact that Seven Wonders was in my top ten for a million years, and it's still, I think, my number eleven. It's gotten pushed out by game, other games, but I still still think Seven Wonders is the best card drafting game. It's one of the best games ever. So why does the new second edition rate near the bottom of my list? And it would be near the bottom, if I had combined this, it would be near the bottom of my entire list because as brilliant as it is, and it continues to be brilliant, the main thing about this second edition is it uh, they, they definitely upped the card quality. They've got this really neat, uh, almost kind of holographic, but not quite this really nice metallic finish to them, the backs and the... And the, the Graphic design of them has been redone, so they're easier to read, and they're just more pleasant. Everything about the game is a much higher overall uh, quality. Plus, they did a lot of tweaking. And I'm no Seven Wonders expert, but I have seen videos from folks who have played Seven Wonders over 4,000 times. And on the whole, it seems like all the tweaks, you know, nerfing some Wonders, buffing up other Wonders, killing some cards, replacing them with different cards, they all seem to be very smartly considered. And so I really appreciate that. So again, why is this rate so low? Because for whatever reason, the publisher decided, you know what? With this second edition, we are going to kill the two-player official rules. And they, Seven Wonders is now officially a three-player minimum game. And that is ridiculous. It really pisses me off, quite frankly. Um, I, I, I just can't believe it. It would have cost them nothing to put that one extra page in the rulebook. Because as near as I can tell, Jen and I, we played it using the Free City as the rules from the original version. Everything seemed fine. I don't know if they took it out because, hey, some of the tweaks and balance it, changes we made means they, the cards don't work anymore. It's probably not that. It's probably more they decided, you know what, we'd really rather people pay attention to Seven Wonders Duel if you want a two-player Seven Wonders experience. And I say no, because Seven Wonders has always been at its best with two. And I was reminded of that this, <clears throat> this month when Jen and I got it out and played it again. So it's still an amazing game as ever, and it just ticks me off to no end that a few years from now, if people go out and get Seven Wonders, and they, they will have no idea that the coolest way to play the game, the deepest, most rich, intricate, uh, complex, but compelling and satisfying way to game, they could still do it if they go into the archives and try to dig up the rules from the original Seven Wonders. And like I said, it just... Ugh, it makes my blood boil, which is why it comes in so low. As a higher player count game, Seven Wonders Second Edition would have been in my number one uh, expansion and in my top two or three of the month. But because they have kneecapped 
the the best way you could ever play Seven Wonders in Gens, in my opinion, and I we're not alone in this. Uh, it comes in at number seven. Seven Wonders, second edition. All right, then we go on to number six, Escape Curse of the Temple Quest. Uh, Jen and I, we had a nice little uh, behind-the-scenes Rado Relax video, which is videos that only backers of my show get to see. And this month we decided we're going to relax and play a game we haven't played for years. And I've really wanted to play these quest expansions and the trap expansions. So we finally played it. And I got to say, folks, the quest expansion box... I was disappointed by Traps. Maybe that's in part because I played it after I played Quest. And Quest is amazing. I think Quest, the, the Quest module, the Quest content you can add to the core game is better than Curses and Treasures, quite frankly. this is The, the Quest is the best Escape has ever been. In large part because we've always loved the Curses and the Treasures, but they can become very... They can really slow the game down. Like, what does this thing do? Because the developers have never actually put icons on all the curses and the treasures, so you don't know what they do. You have to go look it up every time you see a new one. You have to pause the real time and all that. And bleh, Quest is just a really brilliant system where thrown into the deck of all the tiles you're trying to search through, there are a handful of quest tiles. And um, this was based... On player count, well done, um, developers, for actually paying attention to the player count in this expansion, unlike traps. So the more players there are, the more quests you have to deal with. And these just become new things we have to do, in addition to all the normal getting rid of cursed gems and finding the exit and all that. And they work great. They just plug in so nicely. They provide a lot of variety. The base quest box uh, didn't have enough quests, but there have been some promos that add even more quests since then. And if all that weren't enough, this expansion also came with extra tiles that give players special powers based on being unique characters, and that is fantastic too. So Escape Quest is a must-have if you love Escape Curse of the Temple. Uh, masks, or not Masks, uh, Traps is, is, maybe it's good at a higher player count, but I wouldn't recommend it for two. But uh, Quest, we really, really enjoyed a lot. I had a great time playing. So that was my number six, Escape Curse of the Temple Quest. Then on to number five, Paperback Unabridged, which I've been meaning to play for months, and we finally got to the table, and we had a great, great time um, playing the cooperative mode, which is definitely our favorite way to play. Um, we came really close. We just missed uh, winning, but this expansion adds so many... Uh, cool new card types, uh, like uh, you know, like a, th a three-letter, three-letter cards, and um, you know, just a bunch of really neat stuff that you could just shuffle it in and just uh, make use of them as they go. There were a couple of card modules that I was kind of bummed, like the typos one, that fundamentally do not work with co-op. And I kind of wish they had done a little bit more work, Tim Fowers and company, to ensure that everything worked with the cooperative game. Because, uh, you know, hey, the, the competitive game is great too. We absolutely love Paperback as a competitive game, but oh, it's so wonderful as a cooperative game. So it was great to, uh, you know, get the game out and, you know, dust it off and try some stuff. And, you know, this is a dumb little thing, but the fact that they they have introduced more um, paperback books, you know, which are the, the target trophy cards. So there's new art, which means when we set up our little uh, pyramid, we don't have to have repeat art anymore. Doesn't matter at all. Totally aesthetic, but it, it just... It just makes it that much more pleasant to play. We had a fantastic time playing, and uh, yeah, Paperback is not going anywhere, and Unabridged Expansion, highly recommended. Adds so much goodness to Paperback. That was my number five expansion of the month. Then we go on to number four, Marvel Champions, the once and future Kang, and it's Marvel Champions, uh, and people complaining about they constantly came in at the top or near the top every month and said, okay, they'll come in here. And then what happens? They don't come in anywhere near the top. They come in at the number four, which means still one of the best expansions we played this month because Marvel Champions um, ha is in my top 10 games of all time. At last month, I finally said, okay, fine. I have to push it in. I think it's actually what bumped out Seven Wonders and pushed Seven Wonders at 11 was Marvel Champions. And I need to think... Seven Wonders officially isn't a two-player game anymore. I wonder if I need to take it off my rankings altogether. Because officially, they don't want me playing it. They Anyway, sorry. Not gonna relitigate that. Let's move on. So, why is the Once in Future Kang the latest, very cool, really clever expansion scenario for the game? Why didn't it come in my number one expansion? Well, one, there's some very cool expansions I'm about to talk about. Uh, but two, this shows me once again that the developers are doubling and tripling down on the, yeah, you know what, we don't really care about the personal lives of these heroes. We are going to continue introducing new stuff to the game that just fundamentally breaks the conceit that these adventures um, are something that the heroes have to deal with when they're not actually trying to pay their rent and whatnot. 
Now, I love the idea here that this is a game where Kang shows up and players actually get split up and get sent into different time zones and alternate dimensions and stuff like that. And that means for um, for a while, players literally can't help each other. It's like we're both playing our own separate versions of the game, although we're still drawing from the main Kang deck for enemies and stuff like that. And I loved it thematically. And in fact, there's one thing they did brilliantly that I so appreciated. Um, because I've been sent back into ancient Egypt, as part of setup, my obligation cards, if I'm Peter Parker, my having to pay the rent, gets pulled out of the deck. Because in the ancient past, I don't have to worry about um, uh, paying my rent. And instead, uh, new special obje or, uh, obligations that fit the thematic time travel theme are in. And it works so great. I love it. So that's a great first step, dealing with the obligations, but then still, Steve Rogers can still, uh, in ancient Egypt, go and hang around in his apartment in the afternoon. And, uh, I don't, the gameplay is still phenomenal. I don't want to downplay this. This has, this has no effect, and if you don't care about thematic um, continuity, then you're not going to be bothered at all, and this is another great expansion. Uh, I look forward to playing it some more. I think Ant-Man is on the way now, and I, that's, I'm going to be sending Ant-Man through the Quantum Realm uh, to deal with Kang. I'm, I'm very excited about that, but uh, I continue to be bothered by it, and I really, really hope that the developers pay more attention to this in the future, especially because they gave us a hint of it. They changed obligations, and that was super smart. I hope they continue to build on that. But anyway, currently, sitting at my number four, Marvel Champions, the once in future Kang. But then we move on to... Come on. Uh, oh yeah, Russian Railroads, American Railroads, which is great. Oh my gosh, we haven't played Russian Railroads for years. And honestly... I feel bad even talking about this because this expansion is very, very difficult to get. I'm not sure. Is it this one or German Railroads that's hard to get? Or maybe they're both hard to get. They're both out of print. I know one of them, you know, people charge like three, four hundred bucks on eBay for these things. And they're just, just a collection of new player boards. There's really, they are not good enough to warrant paying hundreds of dollars. But I am so glad I have them because they add so much to the game. When Jen and I played this for the first time ever, I cracked 500 victory points. I made 501 victory points. It was such a huge game. And you know all the thematic stuff that comes in to make this an American railroad simulation. You know the Transcontinental Rail and the Golden Spike and the Rocky Mountains and you know blasting tunnels and there's a bunch of cool new ideas. Plus you know new engineers and and a stock market system that I didn't think I was necessarily going to like, but I absolutely loved. Uh, a lot of really great stuff. Jen and I had a fantastic time with Russian Railroads, American Railroads. Then we go on to number two, the Grand Austria Hotel Les Walls, which is um, a uh, paid Kickstarter preview. It's I think it's still on Kickstarter right now. And I think, folks, I read that the only reason it's on Kickstarter is because it's not necessarily ever going to show up in retail. Uh, because uh, Publisher Lookout Games, they contacted distributors and said, yeah, we have no interest in expansion for this. We won't stock it. And so Lookout realized, oh, well, we'll never put this out unless people get through. So that's something you might want to look into. You might be thinking, oh, I'll just catch it when it goes to retail. I'm not sure. It might not be going to retail. That's why I went ahead and backed it myself. Because I played a prototype, and it's so great. It adds a bunch of new modules. Uh, the biggest one being the waltz module, where now instead of sending guests to your to their rooms that you prepared for them in your hotel, you can send them out dancing and get all kinds of really cool bonuses and whatnot. But there's other ones like celebrity guests that can stay at your hotel, unique starting player hotels that give you different abilities and whatnot. But the most important thing by far is that it, uh, one of the modules changes the turn order structure. So you no longer have the snake that can make, even in a two-player game, you might have to wait a long, long time before it's your turn again, where, you know, I, I've heard playing as a four-player game, it's unthinkable because the first player in a round, after his turn is over, he has to wait upwards of 10 minutes, but or even more, before he can go again. They have fixed that with this expansion. And now, to be fair, you can apply the rules. You'll need to proxy some items that don't that come with the expansion, but you can um, retroactively apply these new turn order rules to the original Grand Austria Hotel. And Grand Austria Hotel is still fantastic, but I loved all of the new stuff that Let's Waltz adds. And like I said, it's on Kickstarter right now. I also said this is a paid Kickstarter preview, so you should take my subjective opinions with a grain of salt. But yeah, we loved it to bits. And um, now. Let's go on to uh, my number one of the month, Pandemic Legacy Season Zero, the 1963 variant. And you say, what are you talking about? What? This is a little self-serving, folks. Here's the deal. Um, we finished Pandemic Legacy Season Zero months ago, and we loved it, and we wanted to keep playing it. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to go into spoilers about Season Zero at all, 
Um, but, for people who are wondering, once the campaign is over, the game comes with no system in place to allow you to continue to play. And that's a bummer, because this is so much fun. If you just think of this as yet another pandemic-inspired offshoot, like uh, you know, Pandemic um, you know, Iberia or Fall of Rome, and you, know, and you just call this one you know, Pandemic Age of Spies or something like that, it's fantastic. All the new systems... And I didn't want to stop playing it. I want to be able to continue playing it. So I came up with my own homeschool, home-ruled variants, the, which I call 1963, because 1962 is the year that the game takes place in, and after the game is over, hey, you just go on to 1963, you use my rules. And I'm labeling this number one because, really, uh, I've played this now a few times with Jen, and I've also played it solo a few times, controlling two characters at once, and it is the best gameplay experience I had with an expansion. To be fair, it's an expansion I made because there are no official rules for it. But if you want to know more about it, I've made a video about it live, although warning, it is spoilers. You can watch the first few minutes without spoilers. And I made a, a thread on Board Game Geek. So, long story short, if you're at all interested in Pandemic Legacy Season 0, get it, finish it, and then go check out my variant because I think you'll be very pleasantly surprised to see just how great a standalone ongoing adventure game my 1963 variant is for Pandemic Legacy Season 0. And phew. Okay, folks. That was it. We are done with expansions, or whatever you call what I just talked about. Offshoots, reprints, etc., etc. Now we're going to be talking about completely new games. And I need to get my mouse back, and I've just minimized everything. There we go. <coughs> and, um, oh man, I am thirsty. Just a second. Ah, okay. Let us start with, I think, it's number 23. Is it? Come on. There we go. Yes. Legends of Andor, The Last Hope. And I gotta say, it's a little disappointing this came in at the bottom of my list. Because Legends of Andor, the original one, is one of my favorite cooperative games of all time. It's such a brilliant design. And so much of what makes Legends of Andor brilliant is still here. That core central puzzle of knowing when to fight, and more importantly, knowing when to avoid fights. Because every time you beat a monster, you hasten your own doom, so you have to be very, very selective um, and try to solve the puzzle. All that stuff is still here, and in fact, it's even accentuated, because there's this new system that was kind of introduced in the other expansions. Oh, excuse me, folks. I am going to... I've got a sudden tickle in my throat. <coughs> ah! Hmm. Anyway, so, I mean, there's a new system with gems, which is kind of an offshoot of something they've done in previous... I mean, there's a lot of really cool stuff here. And and uh, it comes with, I think, seven new missions, one of which, like Mission 3 in the original Andor, is replayable with, you know, variable, you know, setup and boss monsters and all that. So it's got replay value in it as well. And it is the culmination. It is the completion of the trilogy of these games. So why did it come in so low? There are a couple of changes that radically alter the feel of the game. One is, there's this new type of monster, two, two new types of monsters actually, that make fighting much, 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 much more common. <clears throat> and fighting, to my way of thinking, has always been the weakest part of Andor. So doing something that means you have to fight three times as much as in the original Andor, is a step down in overall quality. Particularly because the monsters that you have to fight, they're just annoyances. It's not like, oh, at least I beat them and I actually get something cool. You get nothing for beating them. They just kind of go into slumber. There are these undead skeletons and cave sprites that just slow you down. And if you don't fight them off, you'll get uh, bound in place, so you have to fight them. And they're just annoying. Uh, and they just drag down the overall puzzly flow of the game. And we did not like them at all. But then on top of that, they introduced this concept of where um, if you're out and about exploring, you have to feed your people at the end of every day. And if you don't, you lose a significant amount of hit points or willpower. And you know, I love having to feed my people in an economic Euro simulation like uh, Agricola where it feels appropriate, where the whole game is about creating resources and then using them for stuff. Uh, basically, feeding your people in Agricola is just converting resources into points. Here, this is an adventure game. I don't want to be out having adventures, you know, you know, scaling mountains and, and exploring and rescuing people, and then having to stop and dumpster dive every once in a while because, oh my gosh, if I don't eat, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to die. And it just really breaks up the overall flow of the game, robs it a lot of it's just like freedom to explore and do whatever you want and go wherever you want because it's such a high-velocity game. And honestly, I think both of these systems would be much better at a higher player count, quite frankly. Because in a two-player game, um, you know, if you get stuck, 
I have to drop what I'm doing and come help you, which means we have to kind of stick together. If a four-player game, chances are there are other players nearby me who can help out. And in a four-player game, chances are there are other players who are nearby whom we can help me out. If I don't have food and they've got extras, we can work together. But in a two-player game, both of these changes, the increased amount of fighting you have to do, plus the, incre the decreasing amount of time you get to explore, because you have to spend more time scavenging, both of these things combined to make the two-player experience, at least, much weaker to the Andors we've had before. Maybe it'll work better at higher player count. I don't know. But as a two-player game, like I said, we were a bit disappointed by um, Legends of Andor, The Last Hope. Um, even though the core gameplay, the oh man, it's you know that stuff is still so good. But anyway, let's move on, shall we, to number 22, Pan Am which is a very, very sharp uh, game all about, you know, the, the, the golden age of air travel when Pan Am and its rivals were starting to, you know, develop routes around the world and it was still a luxurious thing and all of that. Um, you know, it's a, it's a nice subject matter and the gameplay is really well implemented. In fact, this is a brilliant worker placement game. Uh, it's one of those worker placement games where the worker placement is combined with an auction as I place a worker out, I'm also making a bid and other people can outbid me. You know, think Lancaster and, and other games. So this has been done before. It's done very well here. The thing that really makes this game special is Pan Am. Neither player controls Pan Am. Pan Am is a monster that is constantly, at the end of every round, expanding and gobbling up routes. And we know this. And if we can anticipate where we think Pan Am is going to expand their operations next, and we get into those regions first, then Pan Am will buy us out and give us tons of money, which we can then use to buy stock uh, shares of Pan Am, which is the victory points in the game. That is brilliant. It basically introduces this third player, or in a two-player game, this Pan Am, who we're both trying to figure out, okay, well, we might go over there and, you know, if I can get these, and we're both vying for dominance in trying to be attractive so the Pan Am will buy us. I, I, I love that. I thought that was great. The thing that br brings this game down, why it's at number 22 of the month, and next to the bottom, is there are, um, I forget what they're called, Directive cards, I believe. And it's one of the actions you can do. If you've got nothing better to do, you might as well go buy, get a directive card uh, because they give you special powers. And that's fine in theory, but the powers that are on these special power cards are so all over the place, and they are so swingy. And um, you know they can basically determine who wins and who loses. All other things being equal, you have two equal level players. Whoever gets more lucky going for directives, because some directives just give you points. Some directives give you cool abilities that are very situational. And if you happen to be in a situation where they work, they can be useful. But otherwise, they're completely useless. And you just wish, why couldn't I just drawn some of those point ones? Or some of those ones that let me sell my routes so that I can get tons of points. Very, very disappointed in how they are implemented. If it had been a draw three, pick one, or if there were a bunch out on display and you could pick any of those, you know, ticket to ride style, anything. But they are so swingy. I mean, they will determine who wins the game. If everybody's playing at an equal playing level, <clears throat> they ruined it for me. Because uh, otherwise, this was a very, very sharp worker placement game. But as it is, it comes in at number 22. Pan Am. Then, let's go to number 21, Curious Cargo. Now, this deserves to be much, much higher. I have nothing to complain about the gameplay of this. This is a brilliant tile-laying game, and considering it's a two-player-only game, and it comes in the little uh, Cosmos box line, you might think, like so many two-player Cosmos games, yeah, this is maybe an interesting, fun little thinky game, but it's still just something you play really quick and easy. No. <clears throat> this is one of the heaviest games Jen and I have played all year. Easily. And this is, I think, has to be by far the heaviest board game that has ever come in a tiny box. There's never been, I, I, I suspect. You know, uh, you know, tell me if I'm wrong, but this game is so crunchy. The tiling, where we're trying to create these conveyor belts that will get all the widgets we're making in our factories out to the loading docks so they can be put on trucks so we can score points, um, combined with the card hand management, because we have multi-use cards that let us summon the trucks that we need to load, but they also let us get more of the conveyor belts we need to build with, but we have to store excess conveyor belts in this really restrictive system that makes them very, very difficult to deal with. And on top of all that, as we're laying tiles, not only do we expand outwards, we can expand upwards and cover up existing tiles with new tiles. This is, like I said, this is an insanely crunchy game. It's almost right on the edge of being too crunchy for me and Jen. You know, and, and in the past, I've said that about games like Madeira to give you an idea of just how heavy this game is. Not super complex, but very, very heavy. One of the heaviest tile layers I've ever played. Um, so, 
Uh, but it wasn't too heavy. We really did enjoy that. So why uh, is this coming in so low? Because there's another element of this game. I mentioned how you play cards to bring the trucks in that you load up with the stuff off your conveyor belts. Those cards can also be played on your opponent's factory. And my opponent might have been working really hard to get all her conveyor belts to into position so she can have a perfectly loaded up truck. And I said, oh, yeah, I don't want that to happen, so I'll play one of my cards on your factory and just completely gum up all your works. And what you just spent a half an hour trying to get into position to be able to do, I just ruined it for you. And there's nothing you can do to stop it. Yeah, I denied myself a little, but I probably hurt you more than I denied myself a couple extra conveyor belt tiles. Yeah. This game, in addition to being incredibly heavy, uh, incredibly crunchy, is also very, very cutthroat. And for me and Jen, uh, it's too bad. Uh, and, 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 you know, uh, because I, we, this would totally be a keeper for us and it would probably be in the top five of the month. Because the gameplay is that good. You just have to be prepared to, at the right moment, be prepared to destroy your opponent's plans that they've worked incredibly hard to do. And if that sounds appealing to you, you might want to check out Curious Cargo. I'm sure some people will say, well, you don't have to play that way. Yes, if you want to play suboptimally. I could play this thing that'll give me one point, or I could ruin you, which nets me three points because I prevent you from getting the three points you were going to get. I'll ruin you and prevent you from getting the three points instead of just playing this card to get me one point. That's the thing. If you want to play peak efficiency, you will, at least a couple times every game, really work your opponent over and make them, you know, pound sand. And, uh, yeah, that's just not for us. As much as we loved everything else about 21, Curious Cargo. Then we've got number 20, Kawa. Okay, this is a wonderful, um, you know, the opposite of what I just talked about. This is a light... Uh, very breezy, incredibly relaxing, calm, and peaceful little filler of a game. What's it about? There's a grid of uh, four by four cards that represent a flowing stream. And at the edge of one of the grids, we actually put our flower that is dropping petals. And we are trying to get the petals to drop into the correct currents of the stream so that they can float downstream and hit all the best point scoring cards possible. Um, while also trying to lay claim because once I've got my petals out there, if other players move their petals into spaces that I've already gotten my petals in, I will um, passively score points based on what you do. So it's a really interesting game. It's deceptively deep. It looks so simple and gateway-ish, but there's a lot to consider. Especially because another thing we're doing is we're constantly moving the cards in this 4x4 grid around and changing the flow of the stream. So that it can, um, well, I'll just completely avoid that area you've laid claim over or or what have you. So it's a sharp, sharp game. And plus, it comes with, a, with extra little modules that change it up because there can be different things in the stream, like a katana that will cut your pedals in half and duplicate them. So now a pedal goes two paths and scores more points. And, um, you know, uh, insects and animals, uh, there's a frog and all kinds of stuff that just really introduce interesting, fun, different ways to shake up the core formula. And the core formula is really good. We like this a lot. The reason it's in here is because this is another game where you spend so much time thinking about, right, I know what you're going to do. I can see that. So I should take steps to ensure that it is really ineffective for you by moving, by you know, altering the board so you can't leverage it or getting myself into a position that even if you could leverage it, I'm there first. So now you're going to pay me points and that completely undercuts your ability to do what you want to do. It's, it's not aggressive. Unlike Curious Cargo, you don't take turns that directly... Um, you, just, you just manipulate the state of the world such that... Um, it's better for you, but in do Jen and I found we were constantly like, ah, anything but that. That's the one thing I needed to do. I know, but I really need to put this thing over here. That we were constantly for a game that is all about peaceful tranquility. We were not very tranquil as we played this game uh, because we were basically approaching it in a very cutthroat manner. My wife and I, if a game gives us the opportunity to do it, we'll do it, and then we won't enjoy it. And it's not the game's fault because the game is just being what it is, and that's what Kawa is—a beautiful, uh, reflective. Um, almost meditational, peaceful, calm thing where oh, all I'm doing is just moving some stuff around and watching some petals float down the river. And meanwhile, Jen are like, ah, but if I move this over here, then it goes over there and I cut you off. So um, that's why we had a bit of an issue. Although, I mean, I loved everything about it. I loved the replayability. The presentation is delightful. It's a lovely, charming little game. Uh, my number 20 of the month, Kawa. Then we go on 
to number 19, Beyond the Sun, which is also a very cool game. This is a tech tree game set in, I forget, the 23rd century, the 27th century, something like that. Mankind has got to get off of Earth. We've got to recolonize uh, because we've basically ruined the planet. It's actually kind of a grim and dire and sort of bitter theme of a game, quite frankly. There's nothing aspirational about it at all. Um, but that's neither here nor there. The gameplay is brilliant. Because the heart of the game is this big randomly generated tech tree that's set up as part before the game goes. And as players make different types of breakthroughs, militarily, scientifically, economically, they unlock new branches of the tech tree that gives them new abilities and all of that. And um, opens those up so that other players can get those abilities as well. Although there's this really brilliant bonus system that actively encourages players to pursue their own independent uh, lines of experimentation and discovery rather than just leapfrogging off each other. And sometimes it's a tough choice. Well, that power you just got, I really need that, but I will get a bonus if I come over here and do this one, and this one might work for me because I have imperfect knowledge about what's coming. Although there's an advanced version that you can play with where you have perfect knowledge of what's coming that makes the game significantly heavier, but I think makes the game better overall. So, anyway, we loved everything about the tech tree because as the tech tree expands, you're basically making a bigger, richer, more robust worker placement board. And it's a great little worker placement grid. Our problem with it was all of this technology... Everything that is the heart and soul of this game drives this other little game that's off to the side, literally. You have another little board that is all about expanding and exploiting the galaxy. Uh, you know, trying to get your ships through military might out to all these planets and being the first to colonize them and kicking other players out and trying to race. And all of that stuff was fine. If you like that kind of thing, if you like a little bit of area control and, and all of that, it works very well. Jen and I... We kind of wish the game wasn't about that. We kind of wish the game was just about developing the technology and you know becoming better at the Euro style stuff of you know be becoming more efficient in goods creation and conversion and point generating. If the game had just been about that, this would have been in a top ten of the month, top five or six probably. But it always keeps coming back to everything we're doing is all about trying to um, you know. What do you call it? The jagged elbows? Something like that? Uh, you know, just trying to bump into each other and knock each other around out in space and be the first to claim all these plants to give you amazing cool superpowers. And if you like that kind of stuff, you know, the race to, oh, sorry, I know you were trying to do it, but I just moved in at the last second and colonized it, now you get kicked out. If you like that kind of stuff, there's nothing bad about Beyond the Sun. It is nothing but gravy. If you don't like that kind of stuff, it might still be worth it anyway, because that's fairly soft. It's not really direct conflict. But it was enough for me and Jen to say, boy, we'd like to spend more time focusing on the tech tree and less on colonizing the galaxy in my number 19 of the month, Beyond the Sun. Then, 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 we go on to number 18, which is Dwegar, or Dwergar, I think. Dwergar. I'm not quite sure. The rule book, as always, doesn't come with a pronunciation guide. Publishers, please put pronunciation guides. Anyway, though, this is a fantasy dwarven mining under the mountain style game. It's another worker placement, and it's brilliant because every time you put a worker on the board, you take another worker back, so you're constantly changing the quality of your workforce. Just that idea in of itself is great, but every player is so intertwined with what everybody else is doing because the ore we're mining has to come up via this main mine shaft that multiple players have a vested interest in making the elevator go up so we're constantly um, inadvertently helping each other creating new opportunities all kinds of stuff the worker placement is great the presentation is great um, I love the ore we're actually mining is not cubes but actually little painted rocks I think they're actual rocks um, it was really just a nice extra touch um, the only thing that keeps this out of the higher limits, the reason it's at the lower end, it's kind of a repeat of, which one was it? Um, uh, Pan Am. At the end of every round, there is going to be an event. And uh, the interesting thing is they're all good events. Uh, I, I don't think I saw any bad events, but you can't prepare for them. You have no idea what's coming. And at the end of the round, you draw a new one and everybody hopefully partakes in the goodness of them but invariably what happens is oh uh, an event uh, you know there's put extra grease on the wheel and the elevator moves up two spaces and that's fantastic for you if you had some stuff on the elevator but if you didn't then you just fell behind through pure bad luck 
Um, and, uh, you know, we constantly found, almost without exception, now, you know, some of them, hey, everybody benefits from this, but a lot of times, some players get lucky and some don't, and that really dampened our enthusiasm for what is otherwise a really brilliant goods harvesting and conversion into points worker placement game that has a lot of brilliant, wonderful ideas. Stoking the fires and, um, you know, kind of semi-laying claim to worker placement spots. So many neat things. And honestly, it would be so simple. If the rule was, you know what, at the beginning, like Orléans, at the beginning of the round, reveal the event that's going to happen at the end of the round. So everybody has enough time to prepare to take advantage of that. And then at the end of the round, it happens. This game would have been top five of the month. But instead, they go for... The developers went for the whole, Oh, it's a surprise! You never know what's going to happen! And for me and Jen, that's not something we're looking for. We like to plan and prepare and not just have random swings of luck benefit one player over another. Um, now, I know a lot of people don't mind this kind of stuff at all. And I think a lot of people are really going to love this because the core work, the, the presentation, and the gameplay here is so good. And just this one little thing keeps a Dwergar from greatness in our opinion. But as it is, that puts it at number 18 for the month. Dwergar. Then we go on to number 17. Studies in Sorcery, which is another paid Kickstarter preview. I think the campaign is still live. I don't think it's over now. The game has successfully funded, and I'm glad because it's a sharp little game. Uh, this is a... It's kind of a macabre Harry Potter's type thing, because we're all students of the mystical arts, and we have to we have our midterms and we've got to make potions and, and incantations and stuff like that. And to do that, we have to we need reagents, we need ingredients for all our stuff. And here's where the macabre comes in. Because where do we get those ingredients? We go down to the local graveyard and we dig up dead bodies. Oh yeah. Um, we are all grave robbers in this game. And I, I should stress, this game is done um, very tongue-in-cheek, very charming, really cute and cartoony, but there's this excellent little push-your-luck push mechanism that happens every one, on your turns. Then when you're going to go digging, there are three graveyards, and in each of the graveyards, there's a bunch of face-down cards. You go to the first graveyard, you get to see what all the cards are. If you don't like any, you can say, oh, I didn't find what I wanted. I was really looking for a knee bone. Or, or whatever. Or some mushrooms, or whatever. Um, I'm going to put that back and go on to the next graveyard. And when you skip, the first graveyard gets extra cards. So every time you skip a graveyard to try to find something better in a graveyard you don't know what's still there, you're, you're creating more stuff that your opponents can get on their turn. And you just keep pushing your luck until either you find what you're looking for or you run out of graveyards. And then you get kind of a consolation prize, which sometimes can be the prize you really wanted. It's neat, it's fun, it's fast, it's very charming. Um, you know, and amongst all that, as you complete your school projects, those give you special ongoing abilities that um, you know, give you all kinds of special different... Uh, you know, it's, it's just great. Really, really sharp. And uh, yeah, we enjoyed it quite a bit. And uh, it's what comes in at number 17, uh, Studies in Sorcery. Then we go on to number 16, Mysterium Park. Okay, um, this is... Mm. Sorry, folks. Oh, man. I need to take it down a notch. I'm starting to get a little uh, uh, sore of the throat. Uh, you'd think I talk so much. I, I wouldn't, but, you know, if, if I talk for... What, what, how long have we been at here now? What are we at here? We are at 47 minutes. 48 minutes. Right. If I talk for 48 minutes at full volume, full intensity, it really wears me down. But I'm only at 16. Let's, let's, let's muscle on through. Okay. Mysterium Park is basically Mysterium Express. And that is awesome. Mysterium is already a great game where one player is a ghost who is trying to clue the psychics into how the ghost died by playing um, you know, abstract art cards that have clues hidden in them that the psychic players have to intuit uh, without being able to talk directly to the ghost. Really great one-way limited communication cooperative game. And what Mysterium Park does is it takes that core gameplay, but allows you to have a, a full Mysterium experience in about a third of the time. You can set it up Almost instantly. You can set this game up in under a minute. And um, you can get a game done, like I said, in about a third of a time. And still have all the same wonderful, tricky... What does the ghost mean by this? I'm not quite sure. I'm going to take a guess. And, and the ghost's like, oh, what is wrong with you? I mean, all that stuff is great. Um, there are some big elements that are stripped out of Mysterium to make this work. Some people might be happy that the entire final boss... Um, or, I'm sorry, not the final boss. The final boss does the... 
or the equivalent of a final boss, where you have to figure out based on what's come before. That's still there. But the main thing that's missing, which honestly I really liked, is the voting. Because if one of my fellow psychics does something that I think is dumb, I can bet against them. Uh, and if it turns out I was right, that gives me, um, and therefore all of us, because it's still a cooperative game, more opportunities at the end of the game to solve the final puzzle. So that's been removed just to streamline things. You only do two rounds of inquiry instead of three. Um, the game moves on. Um, you, 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 know, you don't have to wait for everybody to, you know, uh, I mean, uh, I mean I, I, there's, a, there's a laundry list of tweaks and modifications to the original game with a couple of things just really taken out completely. And the thing is, we already like Mysterium a lot. We love it here uh, because it's just so much quicker and easier to pick up and play. Uh, I've got family visiting for Thanksgiving in the next couple weeks. I'm looking forward to getting this out and playing it with them. I think everybody will have a blast. And uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know if I could go back and play Mysterium now. I wonder if it's a Mysterium killer. I might have to get rid of Mysterium. I, there, I would say the, good, the games are equally good. It's just so nice to be able to set it up and just play it instantly without all the sorting cards into different things and, and you know, putting things in slots and, and all that stuff. It's just, it's just so elegant and fast. And yes, 20% of the experience is gone, but the heart of it is still there and the heart is so good. It's my number 16 of the month, Mysterium Park. Then we move on to number uh, 15. What do we got? Seastead. Oh, right. Yes. This was a very nice one. And uh, basically, what would you describe this? It's... Well, th this is a this is basically Waterworld, uh, the board game, and you know it's set on a, a post-apocalypse. Everybody lives on floating junk heaps, and they go diving in the bottom of the ocean to pull stuff up. We've seen other games, and you know, of course, we've seen Waterworld itself. The <clears throat> ah, sorry, the thing that really makes this game stand out is I mentioned this before in this very episode: the notion that things I do on my turn create opportunities for you. Uh, and that is clear um, most readily in the fact that on your turn, you are either going to take resources you previously collected and build a new building somewhere on the seastead that's going to give you special powers and action actions, but will also very likely give other players special abilities and actions as well if they can take advantage of what you've done. Like if you build a port, that means all the areas around the port now give extra points if certain types of buildings are built there. And suddenly there's a land rush for everybody to build those particular types types of buildings, even if they didn't want to, um, to get those extra points, all because one player built a port. That's an example. But even better, on a turn where you're not going to build, instead you are going to dive and go find stuff and bring it back up. And that means you draw a card from the dive deck. And by the way, I didn't mention this is a two-player only game. And uh, this card has two halves that show one half has a bunch of stuff and the other half has a bunch of stuff. Whoever went diving chooses what they keep for themselves and what they give to their opponents. It's an I split you choose, except there's no splitting. The stuff is already pre-split. So when I dive and I can see, oh my gosh, I could get three um, uh, three different items, uh, any ones I choose, or I could get a pair of kelp, the food weed, and that's what I need. I could only get one kelp, but then I could get one metal and something else, but I really need that two kelp. But here's the deal. If I take the two kelp, I'm giving you three things that you want. And that is an incredibly compelling and interesting decision you will have to make over and over and over again. And like I said, it's the heart of this game that players are constantly creating opportunities for each other in this very fast-paced little race. And we really enjoyed it quite a bit. Um, do not be fooled by its standing. I mean, this was a really good month with a lot of amazing games. Seastead and Mysterium Park. And, you know, uh, and, you know, these are all keepers for us. We really enjoyed it. I'm just talking about it. I would like to play it again right now. It's got a great presentation, super fun, fast-playing. Doesn't hurt that it also feels like it's Brink, the board game, and that was the last video game I ever worked on, and I'm very proud of that game, so it has a nostalgia feel for me. But Jen loves Waterworld, the movie. She loves it, so it was nostalgia for her, too. But yeah, we just adore it. Uh, that was my number 15 of the month, Seastead. Then, 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 we've got to move on to number 14. Finishing time, or as it's called in German, uh, Feierabend, which is a German word that is basically, um, you know, close or not closing time, but it's, it's a word for the end of the day when you get to go home after a long day's work. That's Feierabend. It's, you know, it's like holiday time, except it's not really holidays. It's just getting to go home. But and in English, I believe it's going to be called finishing time. I've got the a German copy of it. And it's great. It is the latest 
interesting puzzly little euro from Friedman Freeze, you know, the creator of so many games, most famously Power Grid. And um, like a lot of his games, it's very quirky in how it does stuff. Because um, on the simplest level, this is a worker placement game. But here's the deal. They call it, I believe, a worker displacement game. Um, because all your workers at the beginning of a round are on your little factory. They're working. They're already working. They want to go home. They want to go out for the weekend. They want to go on vacation. They want to go on a blind date. They want to do all these things that lower their stress. Because while they're working, their stress is through the roof. Yes, they're making money. And you need money to do all these activities I was just talking... Or most of these activities. So you need the money to make the activities. But you need the activities to get more rested and relaxed. Um, so that you can face the stress of going back to work. It is a very compelling subject matter. And I think uh, it is thematically realized brilliantly. And, um, you know, all the different things. You can go to amusement parks. Like I said, you can go on dates. You can go on two, three, or four week long holidays. You can just go down to the local pub. Um, or if you need money, instead of relaxing, you can go down to the local pub and work after hours as a bartender and get more stress and make more money. Or you can just relax in front of the TV. I love the theme. I love all the fun little engaging activities. And I, I think I mentioned, uh, Freedom of Freeze's games are often all about timing. Because the interesting thing is, when I put workers out on the board, okay, which is at, at a vacation spot or a rest spot or whatever, that spot is blocked. Nobody else can go there. Um, once I have um, gotten all of my workers out of the factory and out on the board, at the end of my turn, all the workers will immediately come back and go back to work. I'll have a huge stress thing that will set me back on my overall goal towards ensuring everybody's super happy, but I'll make some money that I can use later on. And suddenly, all those worker placement spots that I was occupying are, are open again. And then there is a feeding frenzy as everybody rushes and tries to get them because maybe I got all the really good ones because not all spaces. There are there are awesome spaces and there are kind of waste of time spaces. But if all the awesome spaces are gone, what are you going to do? You got to go for the waste of time. Um, or you could just burn through your workers and get almost nothing out of them so you can re um, so that you can recall faster, so that you can get money, so that you can afford to go to the spaces that are available but are too expensive. There's a lot of interesting timing elements that comes down to the fact that this does not have a fixed structure. This is not at the end of every round, everybody takes all their workers back and now we start. It's constantly in flow where one player has a bunch of workers, the other player is just like, oh, I don't want to put my, because if I put my last worker, I, I'll open up all these spaces and I know you're really going to take advantage of them and ah! And there's this other element as well. On your turn, instead of taking your workers out of the factory so they can go home, they can go on vacation, they can go on strike instead. And this is where the game gets really brilliant. Because there's two resources in the game. Money, um, which you can convert into points, which is relaxation. And the first player to hit 40 triggers the end of the game, 40 relaxation points. And um, the other one is, uh, is, is labor, is worker power, is stri our strike tokens. Because a big part of this game is organized labor. Because at the beginning of the game, our jobs are miserable. We work, I think it's 80-hour weeks, and we make seven coins, and um, we can go on strike. And that means we basically skip a turn. We don't do anything, and we spend some of our strike tokens to improve uh, take-home pay number of hours we work in a week, even gender equality, so we can get closer and closer to true equality, um, or our ability to have organized action so that we can do be more efficient at striking in the future. And this adds such an interesting extra level, both in terms of timing, because it's a way you can delay. I don't want to put my last workers out. I can pause by doing some strikes and getting some bonuses elsewhere, if I have actually spent the time to get these resources. Um, or I can just keep on trying to relax and running the rat race and never trying to improve. Um, and the game has a lot of different paths to victory. There's lots of ways to score points. And it's really brilliant how it all comes together. And I could see this game almost being a valuable teaching tool to introduce people to the idea of organized labor and the power that that has to improve the quality of life. Uh, because you see it play out right in front of you. And you have to make tough choices. Am I just going to try and live my life? Or am I going to sacrifice what little free time I've got to try to make life better for everyone? And I love that theme. I love everything about the theme of this game. And then the gameplay on top of that is very sharp and well considered too. And uh, it's my number 14 of the month. Finishing time. Or Fire Robin. Then we go on to number 13 of the month. 
Alice's Garden. And now, this is a repeat. It was actually in last month's, but here's the deal. If you watch last month's roundup, I mentioned how, yeah, you know, I think the game's pretty cool, but there's this one thing that I think is the way you really should play, and I kind of introduced a house rule variant. I hate house rule variants. Why do I keep talking about house rule variants? I never like doing it. It's just that Alice's Garden, by a we played wrong by accident, and we thought it was so much better. And I talked about this. I said, well, look, the game as it is is fine, but it's much better if you play with this house rule. I come to... Here's one of the many reasons I don't like house rules. I come to you with hat in hand, sheepishly to admit I was playing the game wrong again. And in playing the game truly correctly, which is why I've filmed three run-throughs for this. I got rid of the first two. I filmed a third one this month. My little house rule is not necessary. And if you play the game correctly, everything I wanted, it gives you. At its heart, this is a very clever little abstract polyomino tile layer. And what's interesting about it is it actively encourages you to either play really efficiently and pack those polyominoes in super tight, or play sloppy and try to rush a different type of game end uh, situation. And again, you can watch my run through to see what it is. And I thought that was brilliant, but it didn't really come through. But this month, when I played it correctly, it's great. It works as is. There is no um, player variance needed to get the most out of an excellent little tile layer. My number 13 of the month, which is quite a bit higher. And that's saying something, because this is an amazing month. And it's definitely a keeper for us, Alice's Garden. Then we go on to, what is it, number 12. Bees! Bees! Boy, I guess a few years ago, when Colony Collapse really started being a thing and the news started reporting on it, it seems like half of all the designers in the video game industry said, bees, that's a good idea. And everybody started working on their own bee simulation. And so over the last two years now, we've had just an explosion of bee games. Again, I suspect it's all because they all got the same inspiration at roughly the same time. And um, uh, uh, there, there, there have been some really amazing games that are bee-themed. There have been some solid games that are bee-themed. There have been some that are not worth talking about that are bee-themed. I think bees might be the best one. I think it might be. Uh, this one is less about the colony simulation and, and making honey and all of that. This is just, uh, you've got a bee, and it's a very, very tricky, puzzly little game where your bee is trying to maneuver around a garden to collect nectar uh, to basically, uh, well, to, I guess to put it in the hive and score points because there are different objectives of what color types of pollen you want to put in different uh, rows of your hive. And so there's, a, there's, there's like two layers of puzzliness. The puzzliness of how we get the nectar into the hive, but also the puzzliness of how we move. Because your bee is a little hex piece. And um, the hex tells you that your bee cannot fly forward in a straight line. If your bee wants to fly, um, uh, you know, uh, what is it, like northwest, he can move one space. If your bee wants to fly northeast, he can move two spaces. If he wants to fly uh, southwest, he can move two spaces. If he wants to fly southeast, he can move three spaces. If he wants to fly directly backwards, he can fly three spaces. He can't fly forward at all. And so every turn, you have to decide which way is this bee going to go? Because the bee can't keep going straight. So it kind of represents the Waggle Dance, which, by the way, is one of the many bee games that have come out over the last few years, which is a lovely little game, Waggle Dance. But it re recreates the Waggle Dance out in the field as you are trying to think two, three, four turns ahead. Um, because, right, okay, if I go southeast, I'll move two. That'll put me over there. And then uh, when I'm in that position, if I actually reverse, then I can move three. And that puts me in that spot so that I can finally get to the space I really want to go because it'll be then north east of me, and I'm only allowed to move one at that point, and I'll get there, and that's going to be an amazing three turns until it turns out somebody gets in your way, because now they're in the space that you wanted to land in. It's sharp. Uh, it's very fast, very puzzly, really compelling, wonderful presentation. We were honestly not expecting much. We thought this was going to be a cute little game for families. And, you know, it is a very simple game. You This is a gateway level of rules, but... There, or almost. Maybe Gateway Plus, but probably a Gateway-ish style game. But the depth of this, it's very rare to play a game that has Gateway-level simplicity in terms of its rules, but really crunchy depth in terms of how you actually figure out how to best play. And we were super impressed by number 12. Bees! With a Z. Okay. Then we go on to number 11. The Raiders of Scythia. And here's the deal. This is a remake of Raiders of the North Sea which came out a few years ago, is very popular, has had a couple of expansions, the uh, Fields of Fame and the Hall of Heroes. And basically, Raiders of Scythia takes um, Raiders of the North Sea, plus the Hall of Heroes, 
plus the Fields of Fame, and combines them into a completely new game. Some of the content for the original game and the expansions has been pulled out. Some other new content has been added, specifically animals that will help your raiders become more efficient. And um, But the core gameplay is still here. This idea that um, I, it's a worker placement game where I put a worker to activate an action on the board, and then I pick a different worker up and activate that action. So every turn I'm doing two things. And as other players put workers out, that's giving me opportunities to use the workers that they have put onto the board. It's always been brilliant. It continues to be brilliant. Why get Scythia if you already have Raiders of the North Sea? It's kind of hard to say. Here's why I prefer Scythia. It's totally care by friendly. All the attack, aggressive, steel mess with your opponents has been taken out of the game. The actual rating has gotten a little bit more um, deep with more uh, decisions to make based on your unpredictable strength and damage you will take. Damage was an I wounds were an idea that was introduced in the in one of the expansions but it's really been enhanced and expanded in a very pleasant way that I really like, which is surprising because it's roll to resolve and normally we don't care for it. But, um, you know, it's hard. It's still the same game about building up a crew and then using that crew for all their cool special powers or sacrificing them for different special powers and then doing the worker placement, putting a worker out, taking a different worker back. And it's fun. It's fast. Scythia is a much friendlier game. It's also a smoother playing game. It's, uh, you know, it would definitely be easier to teach I believe, because there's less kind of little outlying rules. It's just overall, it's, it plays faster and smoother, and I think it's the superior game. Now, it's it doesn't get quite as much. If you play North Sea with both expansions, you are playing a bigger game with more choices. It becomes a heavier, more complex game. But I don't think it needs that. I think Scythia just hits the sweet spot, and it's excellent, and it's our number 11 of the month. And I'm going to get another drink of water, because I'm dying here. I've still got 10 more games to go. Oh my gosh. But let's move on to my top 10 of the month. Number 10 is a Trois Dice. An excellent rolling dice from uh, the design trio of the original Trois and many other great games besides. Uh, what is it? Uh, Sebastian, uh, Elaine, and Javier. They have come together, and I believe this is their this is the lightest game they've ever done. It's also, I believe, their first roll and write, and it's a blast. We really, really like it. At its heart, this is a bingo style roll and write where three dice or four dice are rolled every round. One of them is a, a disaster die that will potentially strike at different parts of your city if you haven't invested in prote protection, and um, you know take certain buildings offline. And then the other three dice give are multi use dice. They give you the option to gather resources or to build prestige buildings or worker buildings. And these are all thematically associated with Twa, uh, but I mean, this game is definitely its own beast. This is not Twa simplified and streamlined down. It's a very, very different thing. It's got a Twa theme, but no Twa gameplay. And Jen and I like it a lot. It's got really hidden, surprising death. At first glance, it looks like it's a really simple little bingo thing without much going on, but there's a lot going on. And I know that because if you, like me, are scoring in the low 40s, you have not cracked the nut of this game yet. Uh, because good players get in the 60s and the 70s. I even saw somebody who scored 80 points. And um, I am nowhere near good enough for that, but I plan on continuing to play it because it's just a blast. It's fun. It's fast. There's a lot. I mean, every round, uh, you are having to make a tough, tough choice about, of the three dice, um, wh you know, which one am I going to use, and what am I going to use it for? Multi-use dice is a cool thing. But the other cool thing is, I can see in the next round, I don't know um, what numbers the dice are going to give, but I do know what colors the dice are going to be, so I have some idea of what I'll be able to do in the next round, what might become available. And that becomes a part of my decision-making process this round as well, because of the way the board works, and... It's neat. And if all that weren't enough, the uh, three designers, uh, Elaine, Sebastian, and Xavier, they are right now doing a, uh, a special event where I think every week they are putting up a new PDF that you can download with special thematic... Uh, uh, you know, uh, variant rules for Twa. This is definitely the month of variants. But I'd rather play their variants than mine. But anyway, uh, variant rules where they say, oh, there's a plague, so add this extra little rule or change this little rule and play and post your scores. Here's our scores. So you can feel like you're actually playing against the designer. And I, I played the first two. And again, 
uh, the designers crushed me. But then I see other people posting, and they're crushing the designers. So I know there is so much hidden depth to this game. Um, because it, it seems so simple. But... I, it really is, I think, uh, the combination of having imperfect information about what's coming in the next round, so you can use that to make a smarter decision this round, and um, then using your resources to manipulate the dice, because you have so much control over these dice, and knowing when to do that, as opposed to knowing when to compromise and use what the dice give you, makes twa dice. My number 10 of the month. And like I said, folks, uh, go check out, you know, basically go to the Twa Dice section of Board Game Geek and go to the file section. You'll see they've posted two of them already. They're very, very cool. Uh, um, and uh, see if you can beat them. All righty. Number 10, Twa Dice. Then we go on to number nine. Whistle Mountain. This is a very far out worker placement game. It's one of those ones where players are collaboratively building the worker placement board itself over the course of the game. Because the whole thing is, we're trying to create a scaffolding which is by laying down polyomino shaped tiles. And on top of that scaffolding, we are trying to build machines that basically convert resources into other resources or trigger special abilities and whatnot. And um, so we're, we're doing two layers of tile laying, the base layer and then the machine layer on top of that. And in the process of doing this, we are also creating worker placement spots to activate these machines and activate the scaffolding to harvest resources and convert resources to other resources. And um, we have different shape workers that will fit in this this world that we are building. Sometimes well, sometimes they won't. And if all that weren't enough, there are additional worker placement spaces around the edge of the boards that we are vying for in traditional worker placement because they're very, very powerful things that give you, um, you know, one-time benefits or let you invest in machines and infrastructure and all that. This game is crazy far out. It's got a very silly sense of humor. The theme, I'll be honest, doesn't make much sense. Basically, we're building this super... Uh, uh, contraption machine in a valley where floodwaters are rising. And that's the timer of the game. As the waters rise higher and higher and basically flood out the machine so they can't be used anymore as we build higher and higher, uh, that we get closer and closer to the end of the game. And uh, it's, it's super impressive. You kind of have to just say, oh, this is just some kind of... I mean, and, and also, we're riding around in dirigibles in the Rocky Mountains in the 1800s, making a big steampunk machine that um, we know is ultimately going to get waterlogged and sunk. Like I said, it's the game is silly. It's whimsical, and it's a blast. Uh, players can unlock cool special powers over the course of the game by making certain investments, or you can just be really smart about how you try to build this central board that we're trying to do. You're also, as the flood waters rise, your workers that you send out there are potentially getting swept away, and then you got to spend time and score points to rescue them. There's a lot of neat ideas going on here. It's quite unlike anything else on the market. It is totally fresh and original. It's my number nine of the month. Whistle Mountain. Then we go on to number eight, Shogun no Katana, which uh, uh, is Japanese for the Shogun's Katana. And uh, this was another paid preview for a game that's on Kickstarter right now. It's another worker placement game. And um, it's really good. The worker placement is, um, you know, it's, it's fine. Uh, it's, it's pretty straightforward. It's one of those work placement games where there's very few spaces. And, uh, you know, there, there are good spaces and bad spaces. So you try to race and there's a lot of tension to get to the right spaces at the right time. To gather the resources you need and the blueprints you need to make katanas for um, wealthy lords, families. So you can score lots of points. And you can invest in your ability to decorate the katanas. And you can get special powers. And you can visit the emperor and get special favors and all kinds of stuff. But what really makes this game special is the act of making the katanas. Because you take those katana tiles that have to be filled up. They're like dual layer tiles where you get the resources represented by cubes and you slot them all in there. You put them in your workshop and then you activate your workshop, which is another way you can spend your workers. Just send them to your workshop to activate all the tiles in a given row or a given column of your workshop. And what that does is it means all those tiles slide around. They slide to the next slot. so they can, It's almost like a conveyor belt um, where they move to the next slot 
so they can get their next piece of work done. You know, now they need some steel. Now they need some leather. Now they need some more steel. Stuff like that. And what you have to do is when you're working on multiple katanas at once, you have to very carefully plot out how all of these tiles are going to move around. Because otherwise, you will basically get traffic jams in your um, in your workshop and become hyper inefficient. And uh, you won't be able to do what is ideal, which is with one single worker sent to your workshop, be able to work on two or three swords at once. And if you can pull that off, which is a fiendishly challenging puzzle that is constantly moving and evolving as your tiles move from one space to another to another, it's it's just a blast. We really, really love that. The worker placement is great too. It's got a great presentation. Oh, and not for nothing, this is probably the industry's high watermark for thematic integration in the rulebook. I've never seen anybody do it better. All publishers should study how this rulebook was written um, to to find ways to make their historical simulations or future simulations or whatever come to life in meaningful ways. Everything about this game is top tier. Although, remember, like I said, this was a paid Kickstarter preview, so take my opinions with a grain of salt. But my opinion is Shogun no Katana is my number eight game of the month. Okay. Then we go on to number seven, Glasgow. Or uh, Glasgow, which is a very cool game. Two player only, another game that comes in the little Cosmos size box. And, um,. Yeah, Jen and I, we just played it yesterday, in fact, and we were blown away. This definitely has vibes along the Glenmore, kind of a Glenmore feel, because it is a time track game, like Glenmore or Thebes, uh, you know, where if you make a big move and you skip over a lot of stuff, that means your opponent can take lots of turns in action, but you might want to do it so you can grab that tile that's really far ahead before anybody else grabs it. And so it's got that, which is always fantastic. And here, the game works really well. Sometimes time tracks don't work really well as a two-player game. Um, oh, what is it? Uh, Takedo is a really good example of that. I do not like Takedo as a two-player game at all. But here, it works wonderfully. But then the other half of the game, like Glenmore, is we're gathering resources to be able to build tiles. And basically, we're creating uh, downtown Glasgow. And, uh, you know, it, it's a 4 by 5 grid that expands, and everybody's building in the same space. And some of the things we can put there, some buildings, are factories. And if a factory goes down, that means it can be activated in a later turn to give the factory owner resources if another player builds in the same row or column. And so... I'm in a situation where I really want to build this building and I want to put it right there because it extends an existing tenement and I'll get a lot of points for it, but that means I'm going to put it in a column that lets you run three of your machines. I don't want you to run three of your machines because that'll give you what you need to then build the next building, which I totally want to build. And so, this game, you are constantly paying razor sharp attention to what your opponent is doing because we're constantly creating opportunities for each other. Not cutting each other off, but just creating new and exciting opportunities in a fun, fast playing, time track game. And you know, a lot of times tile layer games where Jen and I are building to the same area, we tend not to like them because they can be really kind of cutthroat. This game can be a little bit, but it's over so quick. This is a filler game. This is a 20 minute game. It's just a blast. We were really Really impressed by this one. It's from a new designer who I, I covered another one of his games. I mentioned in a rundown a few months or around a few months ago. Overstocked, which was another really brilliant design. So he is definitely one to watch. And uh, Glasgow, I imagine it'll be going live uh, or going wide pretty soon. And it's definitely one to look for. My number seven of the month. And this was a big month with a lot of really great stuff. Number seven, Glasgow. Then we got number six, Wild Space, which actually came out several months ago. And, um, it didn't get enough votes from viewers of the show back then for me to cover it. And I just kind of, well, someday I'll get to this. I'll put it on the shelf and we'll get back to it someday. I look forward to it. And we had a quick afternoon. Uh, Jen was doing things. Hey, I'm just going to get this out. It'll only take a minute to read the rules. And we gave it a run. And oh my gosh, this is fantastic. Why is this game? I mean, because like I said, it's been out for a while and it has not caught on. And it really should. Because this is a brilliant Combo chain tastic card game. That's what it's at. Uh, it's all about uh, on your turn, you are either getting more cards into your hand or you are playing cards. And you are always trying to play cards such that, hey, if I play this card, it'll activate that card, which lets me draw two more cards and play a card. And if I play that card, oh, I now I get to play the three cards. And now I put that card out and creating really cool synergy between all the cards in your hand trying to get okay yeah when i play this one card it's gonna go crazy and it's so fun and so satisfying so quick really cool presentation too this is about exploring the galaxy and um dealing with aliens who are all cute adorable anthropomorphized animal humanoid types love the presentation love the gameplay i also 
it love the worker placement. It's a it's a sharp little worker placement game where once you put a worker down, you can never pick it back up, and that worker can do one more action at some point later in the game. But its destiny is presupposed. So when you place a worker, you are deciding what it does now and what it does later, and that's a cool idea too. Lots of very cool ideas in this wonderful, fun, fast playing little game that should so be on everybody's lists. It's so sharp. It's I I sus. Again, gateway, gateway plushes, but just so fun, so fluid, just very impressive. Number six of the month, Wild Space. Then we've got number five, Furnace. Okay, wow. Talk about something really cool and special. This is an auction game. It's the era of industrialization. And uh, we are bidding every round for, was it, six buildings that have come out. And all these buildings do very simple things. Either generate resources uh, like coal and steel, um, or let you convert resources into other resources, or let you convert resources into points. And um, so we're bidding on these buildings to try to get them to add to our own little production chains so we can just make points over four rounds. It's a very quick game, but you get so much done. You start out not doing much, but by the end of the game, you've got a production chain of five or six or seven buildings, and you run them all, and you know, they all just like... If, if you built well, they you know, just daisy chain into each other, and it's super satisfying. Really nice. But here's the brilliant part of this game. Dur at the beginning of every round, when players are bidding, you've got discs numbered 1 to 4. And the higher the number, the higher your bid. And if somebody bids a 4, that's it. They have won that building. But here's the deal. Um, everybody else who bid on that building and didn't win... Before that building goes to the winner, all the other players get a consolation prize. It's, li it's listed on the top of the card. The card's actual ability, which maybe you want, maybe you don't, is on the bottom. On the top is a consolation prize. And sometimes you will bid on a card even though you don't want to win. You're bidding hoping that somebody else will outbid you so you can get the consolation prize because those are birds in the hand. I want those resources right now. I don't want this building that will let me make resources later. I want to lose at this auction. So, but the thing is, when you lose at the auction, the higher your bid, the more powerful the consolation prize. So that's the trick. I'll bid three on this because I want to get three times two. I want to get six coal. Uh, this is what I really want because I need that coal to run my engine right now. And that would be amazing. But what if nobody else bids four? What if I end up with this building? Then I don't get the consolation prize. And what if somebody else then comes after me and bids two, so they still get the coal, and I end up with the building that I didn't want? It's so brilliant. This is one of the smartest auctions I have ever seen, where the auction is combined with worker placement. Because you could be placing these as bids, that's how you think of them, or you could be placing them as workers that you're trying to activate, and that's how you could think of them. But what they do is 100% reliant on what your opponents do. And like I said, this is brilliant. One of the smartest design uh, conceits I have seen in years. And then on top of that, it's just a very sharp goods production engine chain in game two. This could have been number one or number two of the month if the cards did something a bit more complex than just uh, generate goods or convert goods into other goods or convert goods into points. I'm thinking specifically of Fantastic Factories that came out a few months ago. If this game had some of the more complex functions... This would be best of class. This would be top 20 of all time. But even still, this is my number five of an incredibly big month. Because uh, even if I wish the, the actual, the, the, the core gameplay here, what you do with the gameplay is nice, but the way you do it, it's best of class. And then on top of that, did I mention, players get unique special powers as well. So definitely be on the lookout for this. Right now it's only available in Russia, but it has been picked up for wider distribution uh, by Arcane Wonders. I believe that's been announced. Oh, I hope that's been announced. Anyway, um, so it'll be coming soon with, I don't know, maybe, fingers crossed, some slightly more complex cards. I do know, uh, well, more about that. I, I, I have actually, I, I should say nothing. Uh, one of the things I complained about in my video, I believe is being addressed because uh, both the new and the old publisher have contacted me and said, what do you mean about that? What about this and that and the other? Go watch my run uh, rundown if you want to know what I'm talking about there. But, I see a bright, bright future for my number five of the month, Furnace. Then we go on to number four, Pandoria Merchants. Wow! Jeez Louise, um, a lot of top ten of the year candidates are coming out this month. No surprise, that's always the case. All the best stuff of the year always comes out at the end of the year. And Pandoria Merchants is amazing. This is a roll and write. And I'm not saying this is the heaviest roll and write ever. That would probably still be Roman roll. I'm saying this is the second heaviest. 
And that's saying something. This is, well, originally Pandora, which came out a couple of years ago from the same publisher, same design team, uh, Bernd Eisenstein and Jeffrey Allers. Great, great design uh, combo. Uh, that original game was kind of like a Euroe 4X game where we were exploring in a new land by laying t uh, two, or um, what do you call them? Um, domino tiles that, uh, you know, we, we explore by putting these domino tiles on the board and shows what resources you can exploit from the land. And uh, then, as we ex exploit and get all these resources, we could expand our industry by playing cards uh, that give us like fantasy buildings and spells and stuff like that. And then we could exterminate. Because one of the ways that we could explore and expand um, led to other players getting um, having their workers kicked off the board. And we loved everything about Pandoria except for that exterminate. Except for the fact that, oh, I've worked so hard. I've got that worker in position. He's going to get such a huge payday. And then you kill him. And it's like, oh, oh, all right. So we didn't keep Pandoria. Pandoria Merchants takes the same basic idea. This is not like Twa, where it's a wholly new game. This is Pandoria, done in roll and write form. Instead of uh, dominoes, we roll two dice that kind of represents a dynamic domino. So you never know exactly what tile laying you're going to be doing. But you're still exploring, expanding, and exploiting, but no exterminating. Because once you put your workers on the board, they can't be killed. They cannot be eliminated. And so they will stick around. And then the rest of the game, you know, building buildings that give you special powers, casting spells, gathering resources. Um, um, you know, uh, harvesting bigger and bigger areas as we explore and expand. This game is fantastic, and it is amazingly crunchy. This is so much heavier than just about any other uh, roll and write on the market. Because this is a full boxed, you know, big box tile laying 4X game brought into roll and write form with the fourth X taken out, and it's amazing. It's my number four of the month. Pandoria Merchants. Definitely look for this one, folks. It's phenomenal. Then we go on to number three. Um, do we? Yes. Praga Caput Regni. Or Crada Caput Regni. Not sure how to pronounce that. I believe it's Latin for Prague, the capital of the kingdom, I believe. Or worse to that effect. Uh, Jen and I, we did a live playthrough of this last week. We had a great time. And uh, yeah, we are loving this. This is the latest from designer Vladimir Suchi. And as always, Vladimir knocks it out of the park. Uh, this is the second big box game uh, from his new self-publishing outfit, him and his wife, uh, Delicious Games. And the first one, Underwater Cities, really blew up. Became a super uh, well-loved darling. And I think... Uh, no, I don't think. I know. Jen and I like Praga more. It's not quite as heavy as Underwater Cities, but it is a brilliant Euro of, of uh, you know... Plate spinning in the best way. So many things going on all the time, trying to focus on, um, you know, how are we developing the medieval city of Prague? Are we getting buildings built? Are we getting resources from the mines? Are we investing in the upscale or the downscale section of the city? And um, are we contributing to the cathedral? All these different things we can balance. Are we upgrading our own ability to um, supplement other actions we can do? The whole thing is driven by this very cool little um, wheel that is uh, in one corner of the board that kind of, at first glance, looks like the wheels of uh, Zolka the Mind Calendar, although it's a very different gameplay feel, but it's a brilliantly implemented system that um, very strictly limits. It's kind of like a dynamic rondelle that is constantly re- uh, inventing itself and morphing and changing, cha uh, which you know gives you access to different things at all times. The core game itself is also very fast playing. I mean, uh, this is a big old heavy game that you know it feels like when the time you're done, wow, that took us three hours. It was so you look like oh. We did that in under 90 minutes. And, I mean, that may sound bad. I mean, it may sound like I'm saying, oh, it's really boring. But no, it's just like you feel like you've done so much. This, you know, But it's that, all you did was you took 16 quick turns. And, um, you know, with a very small list of actions. And yet, you feel like such an amazing accomplishment as you build and build and build and things compound into other things and you unlock more special abilities and, and it's just the bee's knees. This is Vladimir Suchi at his best and we love it to pieces. I think this is going to make a lot of people's top 10 of the year. I'm just calling that right now. It's probably going to make ours. I see it's almost... Uh, uh, and by the way, I should mention, by the way, folks, if you do go watch that run-through, that live playthrough Jan I did, please bear in mind, I was playing with a prototype, and it turns out my prototype had a misprint. The gray tiles, the gray action tiles we were using, um, there were two missing actions. There were two extra road 
uh, uh, spaces and and a missing and two missing quarry spaces, which led to the problems we ran into. But even still, they had a great time. I cannot wait to get a final retail edition of this. Although, I mean, just talking about, it, I want to play this game right now. I, I could happily play this game about half a dozen times before the year is out. It's so good. My number three of the month, Praga Kaput Regni. But there's still better stuff, folks. Of course there is, because it's Feld month, and my number two of the month is Cocopelli. Oh my gosh! Wow, this is a paid preview. It's on Kickstarter right now. And here's the deal, folks. This, if if I didn't tell you that this was a Stefan Feld game, you wouldn't believe it. I wouldn't believe it if I didn't know for a fact, because this feels like nothing else he has ever done. Somebody mentioned, and I, I think it makes a I, I think it was Paulo, my rules goof checker, mentioned it feels less like a Stefan Feld game and more like a Carl Chuddock game. It feels like it has more in common with Glory to Rome than it does with Trajan. And that's saying something. This is a completely new game that feels very, very different, and I love everything about it. Most importantly, what I love about it is the central theme of this game is celebration. We are a bunch of Anastasi North American tribes who are coming together to have celebration upon celebration, share, have cultural exchanges and all kinds of stuff. Beautiful theme of togetherness, which we need now in our in our world more than ever before. And what that means is I've got a handful of cards, which are celebration cards. I can start celebrations in my tribe, or I can start celebrations or extend the celebrations you start on your tribe on your board. I can uh, get access to a couple of them to my player to the right or the player to the left. It works a little bit differently with two players. And it's so great. Um, because these celebrations, once they get a certain number of cards extended, they will finish, and whoever finishes them gets points, but while they're going, whoever owns the celebrations gets really cool special powers that radically change the game. The game, I think, by default comes with 16 different celebrations with different cool powers, like really radical game-changing stuff, but there's a bunch more coming, or maybe it's an expansion, I don't remember. You can go check out the Kickstarter page. And it's just, it's, I mean, Jen and I, we played this game, five, I think we played it five times now, so we just keep coming back to it, and that only almost never, ever happens. And like I said, um, it's it's Feld at his best, but it's Feld doing something, Stefan Feld doing something he has never, ever done before. It's maybe kind of close to the old Roma games in that, but even then, it's so different from that. It's really special. We love it to pieces. Uh, like I said, it's on Kickstarter right now. Remember, this was a paid Kickstarter preview. I already mentioned that. Uh, it's my number two of the month, Cocapelli. And uh, let's talk about the number one. Steffenfeld strikes again with Castles of Tuscany! Yes! And yes, folks, I know there's another Steffenfeld game, Bonfire. Fingers crossed the publisher sends me a review copy. I would like to cover it before the end of the year and see if it makes it into my top ten of the year, but I don't know. Um, but Castles of Tuscany just showed up this week. And I'll and I'll be filming it next month. I'll be doing a run-through of it. Or maybe we'll do a live playthrough. I don't know. I haven't thought about that. Uh, it'd be a good one to do for a live playthrough. But anyway, it is brilliant. Uh, I talked earlier about Mysterium kind of being, or Mysterium Park being Mysterium Express. That's kind of what Tuscany is. Tuscany is kind of Burgundy Express. And I'll tell you this right now, folks. I will never, I don't think I will ever play Castles of Burgundy at a higher than two player count again. Because Castles of Tuscany does, in a completely new and different way. Here, this is the, it's mind boggling to me. This game does feel like Burgundy. You know, it's the same kind of thing. We've got our colorful landscape. We're trying to expand and fill certain tiles in to unlock bonuses where the sooner we can score these things, the more we can um, repeatedly rescore them over the course of the game. And um, new tiles are coming out. We have to store them before we can build them. And we have to manage storage. Um, and the whole thing is driven by cards instead of dice. There are no dice. And uh, it's just brilliant. And it may sound like, what, well, wasn't there already... Castles of Burgundy, the card game? Yeah, kind of. And this is kind of. This is kind of Castles of Burgundy. Mixed kind of with Castles of Burgundy, the card game. But then done in a completely different way. That just makes this feel so different. Um, while still being... I mean, oh, I, 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 I cannot put into words how much Jen and I enjoyed this. I asked Jen after we played it. And she agreed. If we, this is the best game we played of the month. One of the best games we played of the year. I'd happily play it again right now. It's And it is. I mean, Castle of Burgundy is my favorite Stefan Feld game of all time. I think it is his best game. And this game captures the feel of Burgundy, but plays in half the time. And, um, you know, it changes dice, rolling dice, to determine what type you can grab. And instead um, uh, does drawing cards, which is kind of like the card game. But it's cool 
in that, I mean, I've heard some people say, oh, it's so luck dependent. I think you have so much more control because of the cards. Because in Castles of Burgundy, you roll those dice, you got to use those dice this round and just figure out what you can do with them. And yes, you can manipulate them and all that, but you're, you're, you're stuck with them. In this game, instead of rolling dice, you can draw cards and um, you need to play cards instead of playing dice. And you need pairs, or you can convert pairs into other pairs, and um, or into, into other cards. And you can manipulate the cards using workers. You can do a lot of the same stuff. But this gives you a level of control you don't have in Burgundy because things can be long-term preparation. You can... I mean, this game... This game feels like Castles in Burgundy crossed with Ticket to Ride. That's what this is. And that's weird. And that's quite unlike, it's quite unlike Burgundy, that it has this speed and this elegance. Because often your turn will be, I'm just going to get a couple cards, and I'm going to do that again, I'm going to do that again, I'm going to do that, and boom! I'm going to do a super monster turn, because I've got a hand of 15 cards that I've been building up for a while, and I've just been waiting for that one card that will create this huge cavalcade of things. And it, it just so radically changes the core feel of Burgundy, while you're still doing kind of the same stuff. I'm blown away by it. I cannot put into words just how great this is. I mean, I'll probably play it some more, and then I'll do a run through, and maybe I'll be able to when I when I when, when, when but I mean, right now we played it this month. It snuck in under the wire and became our number one game of the month. And uh, here's the deal: right now, this is sitting in my top thirty games of all time, or is it my top twenty? I forget. Is it, you know, this is in like high twenties. Um, if this game had the science tiles from Burgundy. That's the one thing that I missed from Burgundy that this doesn't have. This would probably go into my top, in, into my teens. Somewhere between top 10 and top 20. The game is that good. And it is superior to Burgundy when played at higher player counts. Because if there's one problem with Burgundy, Burgundy is, if anything, longer than it should be. And Tuscany is Burgundy the right length. And it's amazing. It's my number one game of the month. And oh my gosh, folks, that was a lot. Are you still recording? Yes, you are. At an hour and a half? Oh, sorry, folks. But hey, we talked about a lot of games today, didn't we? Yes. Yes, we did. Okay. Um, Yeah, I think the month of November, even though there's some really cool games, if you want to know what I'm covering, as always, hit that I in the top right corner screen. You can go to comingsoon.rondo.com and you can see what's the plan. I think both Jen and I are a little frazzled. Uh, the month of November, I think we're going to take a breather and maybe not cover quite as many games because I kind of went overboard, as you just saw. We'll see, though. I mean, who knows? Depending on uh, how things play out in the month of November, maybe we will need more of a distraction than we normally do. Fingers crossed. Um, but that's it, folks. And uh, thanks, as always, very, very much for watching. Have a very nice day. And uh, even more so, as always, Thanks to Funnigan Games for sponsoring the show. And, um, you know, they, they've been great. And uh, I'll be, oh man, I'm exhausted. So, talk to you later. So long. Uh, bye bye.